Thanks, Adam. No problem. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. It's wonderful seeing you all here. And it's wonderful being here uh, to have an opportunity to talk about the work that we are doing in autonomous neural control. So I'm a part of the Center for Implantable Devices at Purdue University. And that's a partnership between faculty members in biomedical engineering and in electrical engineering, along with our undergraduate, graduate, postdoctoral students, research scientists, and staff. And we're working together to lead the research, development, and most importantly, translation of implantable medical devices. And we do this in a partnership with physicians and with industry so that the inventions that we come up with won't be limited to an academic publication and to the laboratory bench, but will actually go out and have maximal clinical impact. And that's really the goal of everything we do and all of the folks that you see in this collage here. The, the focus of the research that we do is in epilepsy. And to understand why, let me go back a little bit to the story of this young man, Christopher Donaldy. Christopher Donaldy uh, was, is from uh, Utica, New York. And like three million Americans suffered from epilepsy. Now, of the three million Americans, 1% of the population that suffers from epilepsy, uh, a third, 30 to 40%, are not responsive to drugs. But Christopher was one of the lucky ones that was responsive to drugs. Nevertheless, when he was 21 years old and he was getting ready to graduate from business school, he went into a seizure one afternoon and died. Um, the cause was sudden, unexplained death from epilepsy, or SUDEP. And if that's not a terrifying acronym. Um, Christopher was one of 50,000 Americans who die each year from epilepsy. That's more than breast cancer. And, um, and so the work that we're doing is to try to figure out a way to understand how epilepsy occurs, how we can predict or detect epileptic seizures, and then how we can turn around and perhaps stop them, particularly in the patients who are not drug responsive or are not fully drug responsive. Um, more recently, we've been working a lot also with the Department of Defense doing work on restoring mobility to some of the war fighters coming back from the Middle East. Since 2001, since 9-11, 1.6 million Americans, approximately a little more than that, have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Of those, 320,000, that's 20%, uh, have suffered a traumatic brain injury. That's a little more than the entire population of the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, of those 320,000 who suffered a traumatic brain injury, half will become epileptics, which means that over the course of the next few years, more of our veterans coming home will die from their seizures than did from their combat injuries. Uh, Christopher's parents, Gene and Barry Donaldy, uh, channeled their grief at their son's death by teaming up with an organization called CURE, Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy, up in Chicago. And what they do is they raise money to promote awareness and fund research of epilepsy. And in fact, they funded the very first Christopher Donaldy Award um, from their fundraising efforts, and that came here to Purdue. That was the first grant I ever got, along with a colleague of mine, Jenna Rickus. And with that grant, we started a program that's now eight years old in developing medical devices to treat epilepsy. And we started looking at how other folks do this right now. So if you're not drug responsive, uh, you can get a surgery, but surgery involves finding the area of the brain where the seizures begin and then removing that. And you can imagine that's not optimal, right? So, so trying to come up with a third way of curing this disease, uh, we looked at device manufacturers, like one, for example, in Houston called Cyberonics. And we've teamed up with Cyberonics since then. I've been working very closely over the last few years. And what they do is they electrically stimulate the peripheral uh, nervous system, actually the cranial nerves, and that stimulation propagates up to the brain and preempts the seizure. What we wanted to do is to understand that a little bit better. And in particular, one of my students, Matthew Ward, who's sitting here in the audience today, had this idea that really we don't care how much current we're delivering, and we don't care how much therapy we're delivering. It's, it's analogous to if you have a sinus infection, you go to the doctor's office, the doctor will give you 500 milligrams of amoxicillin, take it three times a day for 10 days and you're cured, right? They'll give you the same prescription if you're a 90 pound ballerina or if you're a 350 pound linebacker. They'll give you that prescription if you're young, 
if you're old, uh, irrespective of anything else. And what happens is that each of us responds differently for, for reasons of genetics, for reasons of physiology, we respond differently to therapy. And what we care about is not what is coming in within safe limits. What we care about is how is our body responding to that therapy. So Matt's idea was that instead of stimulating and hoping for the best, what we would do is we would stimulate and then we would record the body's response to that therapy that we are delivering and call that a biomarker, right? And so we would record this biomarker and then we would do studies to understand what is the optimal levels of a particular biomarker that lead to optimum therapeutic efficacy, in this case, a reduction or an elimination of seizures. And then doing that, we can optimize therapy individual by individual. So in the case of epilepsy, we start out with a patient, and we look at uh, one of the cranial nerves, the vagus nerve, the trigeminal nerve, one of several cranial nerves, and we look at that nerve and we record the activity that's coming out of that nerve, and we break it up into the different fibers that make up the nerve. So there's A fibers, B fibers, C fibers, and briefly, A fibers carry information away from the brain, C fibers carry information to the brain, and using algorithms that we've developed, we can tease out which fibers are responding to which type of stimulus. And then we can close the loop and stimulate in a way that we can get the activation level of each fiber that we want. We can then determine for a particular patient what is the optimal activation level of each of these fibers to improve their therapeutic outcomes. We can dial it in and then we can have an improved efficacy for epilepsy. And not just epilepsy, but it turns out that this is broadly applicable to a wide range of conditions. So the fundamental nugget here, the, the, the key idea behind this concept is that essentially what you want is to figure out how is the brain responding to a therapy, in this case electrical stimulation, and then you want to lock that response level in and let the input, whether it's a drug or an electrical current or whatever, let it vary within safe parameters to give you that constant level of physiological response over time. And the hope is that that'll give us a better result. And then we can add one more little wrinkle, and that is a third party it doesn't have to be a third party, but third party uh, biomarker data. So you could say, for example, again, using epilepsy as an example, you could say, all right, so we've identified the right level of fiber activation to stop seizures. Now, we don't want to deliver therapy all the time, right? We want to deliver therapy only when you need it. So we're going to look for another biomarker, which is when are your seizures starting? And then we're going to apply the therapy just at that point where you need it. And in this way, not only do we optimize therapeutic outcomes, but we do it with the smallest possible dose and consequently the least number of side effects. And how do you bring all this to bear? So fundamentally, at the end of the day, you've got an algorithm, you've got the capability to record and stimulate and so on, but if this is gonna be clinically relevant, you've gotta miniaturize it. You've gotta make things small enough to fit inside the body. And that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing. And here you have a photograph of a device um, this is an implantable medical device. It's about three millimeters by 12 millimeters. It's on a flexible package. It has a microcomputer, which we've designed and fabricated, and that microcomputer records signals. It sends out stimulus. It does the digital signal processing on the recorded biomarker data, and it has the antenna so that it can communicate with the outside world and allow the outside world to communicate with it. So the physician can see you at your doctor's visit, and they can say, all right, what's the optimal level for you, and they can dial it in, wirelessly program it, and have this device work as well as it possibly can be. In addition, we've included some supercapacitors, which is very, very high energy density um, charge storage devices. They act like a battery, and that fit within the overall size, and that allows us to get rid of batteries altogether, and once this device is implanted, we can recharge it wirelessly. So the device will run wirelessly and autonomously for the lifetime of the patient. Beyond epilepsy, I mentioned that there were some other applications, and we've explored a few of these in brief in our center. One of them is depression. Um, and in depression, just quickly, what we want to see in depression is a different biomarker. We're not looking at seizure initiation. We're looking at inflammatory cytokines. Uh, they're markers for a certain degree of inflammation, which is correlated with depression in a patient. And what we want to see is, can we reduce the amount of inflammation response in your body using electrical stimulation? And 
people have done this and they've shown that it works. And then what we wanted to do is say, all right, can we apply our autonomous neural control algorithm and hardware to doing the same thing? And by doing this, can we get a greater reduction in the inflammation response? And the answer is yes. The gray bars are our way, and the black bars are the standard of care, and our way gives you less inflammation than the standard of care. It's better than this because we're able to do this with one-tenth of the dose that the standard of care uses. So not only do we get a better effect, but we get that better effect with less dosing. And then finally, we've done some pilot work in alcoholism. Now we're moving into the brain where we're doing electrical stimulation in the brain, and we've been able to show that we can get our alcoholic subjects to drink 30% of what they used to drink with electrical stimulation alone. And then the question is, can we close the loop? Can we measure a biomarker and get the same improvement in efficacy over time with the autonomous neural control that we see with open-ended control now? Thank you very much.